Okay, so welcome back. And um, now we are going to have the next speaker. And um, so I'm going to say welcome to Scott. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm really good. Welcome to AeroPython 2021. Um, where you. are you streaming from? I'm streaming from Brooklyn, New York, in the United oh. States. Cool. So what's time? What time is there? It's quite early for you, right? Uh, it's about eight fifteen in the morning. Okay, nice. It's not so bad. <laughs> not so bad. <laughs> cool. Uh, How is the weather in New York? Is, okay, it's summer like here. Uh, yeah, it's you know the usual hot and humid. Okay. <laughs> Yesterday was about thirty degrees. Okay, I. I I don't miss that. I'm living in Amsterdam, and we don't have that in the summer here. So I think that's uh, that's super good. Uh, I really like your T-shirt, by the way. Uh, oh, me nice too. To support <laughs> by ladies. Thank you for that. So Scott uh, is working for Bloomberg, and uh, he's a senior engineer, uh, a manager in Bloomberg, and he's helping also, uh, of course, to develop Python applications. And uh, he's also teaching internally in Bloomberg. So. That sounds uh, super good. And he's going to be talking about funk tools. That's a lot of fun. So let's put your screen in the stage. Cool. So all yours. Good luck. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, so as I was introduced, my name is Scott Irwin, and I work for Bloomberg Engineering. And today we're going to talk about a hitchhiker's guide to funk tools. And it's kind of interesting that I proposed this talk at the very beginning of uh, June. And thank you for the conference organizers for accepting it. And about three weeks later, Martin Hines uh, wrote a blog post pretty much about uh, Funk Tools and, and all of the wonderful features that are in there. So there's something sort of in the Python zeitgeist that is, is generating interest in what has actually been around for a while. Uh, so this is not going to be in depth in any one aspect of it. So several of the aspects you could spend a whole uh, conference talk just on that one thing. But this is more just a, an overview to give folks an idea of what's there for further investigation within your own projects. So what we're going to cover is we'll talk a little bit about definitions and histories, and, but that's very quick. Um, and then we're going to get into the substance of Funk Tools. Uh, we'll talk about simplifying function signatures, function wrappers, caching. We'll touch on ordered types. We'll touch on reduce. And we'll actually introduce this concept of function overloading in Python. For those of you who are coming from maybe a different language and you heard that Python doesn't support function overloading, that's not completely true. Um, Python does have a way of supporting function overloading via the Funk Tools module. And then we'll wrap up and I'll uh, include some references, including a link to uh, Martin's blog post. So quick definition in history. So the Python standard library module Funk Tools contains several higher order functions. Um, so what does that mean? What is a higher order function? So they are functions which act on or return other functions. So basically, they take a function as an input or they return a function as an output. Um, a higher order function that many of us are uh, familiar with are function decorators. They're, that is a, an example of a higher, higher order function. Um, just a quick history on Funk Tools. It was actually added back in Python 2.5 in 2006. And its initial uh, members of the module were wraps, update wrapper, which those two are very closely related, and partial. Um, additional functionality was added. Um, reduce was added in Python 3.0 and backported to Python 2.6. Uh, total ordering and a uh, Comp to key, which we're not going to talk about at all, was backported to Python 2.7, plus LRU cache was added. Uh, 3.4 brought in partial method and single dispatch. And Python 3.8 brought in cached property and single dispatch method. And most recently, Python 3.9 brought in cache. So you can see that this uh, module 
is evolving over time and it is continuing to evolve um, even in the newer versions of Python. So simplifying function signatures and what that basically means is partial and partial method. So partial is a, a function that takes a function as an argument and it takes a set of arguments, both positional and keyword. And those inputs are essentially locked in arguments to the function. And then partial returns what's called a partial object, which behaves like the original function with those arguments already defined. And so that's a lot of words. Let's look at a quick example just to get a sense of what that is. So here um, in the example below, we're taking the function pow, and we're essentially predefining the exponent to be two. And so we're taking the return of that and creating a new function called pow2. And here in the example, we can see if we pass pow2, just the single value five, that we end up getting um, five squared or five to the power of two, the value 25. And so this is just a quick example. Um, but where you would really want to use uh, partial is to transfer, transform multi-argument functions into a single argument function in places where it's required. So an example here is map. Map requires um, only a one argument function. But what if you have a two argument function or a three argument function that you want to use in map? Um, it's possible without partial, but it ends up being much more verbose. So here are some, um, at the top here, we have the example with partial. And uh, you can see that it is relatively compact and fairly straightforward to read. So I'm doing map on pow with an exponent of three. I can just kind of read that across. The list here is just because map returns a generator. And I just wanted to realize the, the results of that generator. Um, I could do the same thing by, de it, by defining an external function and then using that external function in map. But this is like two extra lines of code. and and. And where it's actually used, it's not exactly clear what this PAL3 is. So imagine that the PAL3 is defined in some other place, distant from where it's actually used. Now I don't easily know what this thing is about. I could also use a lambda, which kind of brings the definition close to the use. But there's a lot more typing here. And, and it's not 100% clear what is going on. Um, so the partial just becomes a way of creating something that is a little cleaner and a little easier to read. I can also use partial to simplify code. I can use it to define functions that are easier to type, read, and importantly, friendly to code completion. So here I'm, per, I'm using partial to define a function called print standard error, where I'm just using the print the built-in print function, but I'm setting the output to be standard error. So now when I want to print something to standard error elsewhere in my code, I can use this print under bar standard error. And because this is defined as a function, I, when I'm in my editor, I can, I can do uh, code completion on print under bar standard error. It'll be available and it just makes it simpler and easier to use where I could use print open paren file equals blah, blah, blah. But that's a lot more to type in every place I want to use it. And it's not very friendly to code completion. Related, closely related to partial is partial method. And the easiest way to think about this is that it's partial for class methods. From the Python docs, it returns a new partial method descriptor, which behaves like partial, except that it's designed to be used as a method definition rather than being directly callable. Um, the, the function that's in the argument here in partial method must be a descriptor or a callable, but all that really means is that if you have a method in your class, it, it fits the bill. So here's a quick, um, this is lifted directly from the Python 3.9 docs. There's nothing um, very uh, 
original here. Um, but I have this class cell. I have a property called alive. And I have a, a set state for that property that will take a Boolean, either true or false, to set the, the state of the cell to be either alive or not alive. Um, now, I, I can use partial method then to create these two convenience methods, set alive and set dead, that just basically predefine the true or false for set state. And now inside, uh, uh, in this case, a REPL, but also in terms of uh, code completion, I now have this set alive convenience function available to me that I can just call and use without having to type out uh, the more, impl more verbose implementation. So that's simplifying function signatures. Now let's move on to function wrappers which is wraps and it's cl uh, closely related update wrapper. So wraps takes a function that it's wrapping uh, or, or that is to be wrapped. It's a function decorator used when defining a wrapper function. It updates the wrapper function's attributes to be the same as the wrapped function. And, and as I've alluded to, it's a convenience decorator factory for defining uh, defined using update wrapper. So it's, Basically, it's uh, it's syntactic sugar for update wrapper. So if we didn't have wraps, what we would end up with something like this. So I have my decorator. I have an, a wrapper that's defined within that decorator. And I use that to wrap a function. Um, but when I, and when I call that function, the wrapper is called, then the function's called, then that's fine. Everything functionally works. But when I look at the function name, it's it's this function up here, wrapper. It's not the original func. So where this is important is like in stack traces or in error messages. It's gonna it's gonna be confusing as to where the failure actually is. Also, the doc string is picking up the wrapper's doc string and not the original function's doc string. So if we use wraps, we essentially, it just becomes a decorator on the wrapper function itself, and it takes as input the original function. And so now, um, functionally, everything still works the same. The wrapper is called, the function is called, but now the, the function name is what I expect. It's the original function, and the doc string is coming from the original function. And so this is just to make uh, my code behave more like what I would expect it to be. Update wrapper is rarely used directly. Um, it updates the wrapper function attributes to be the same as the wrap function. It's useful in situations where the decorator wraps cannot be used, such as wrapping a function after it's defined or wrapping a function you do not own. Um, so here's a quick example. Um, I'm grabbing from the string library, the standard library function cap words. And I'm, I'm wrapping it in this thing called my cap words. And when I call my cap words, it, it works like I expect. Um, but the, the name of the function as well as the doc string, the doc string is quite long, so I didn't include it here. Um, it's not reference, it's referencing mine, but maybe I want it to behave in the context like it it is the standard library cap words. So here I can use update wrapper to take my original function and say all those function attributes, just make them the same as the original string.cap words. And so now um, if I look at the name for string.cap words for the local cap words and my cap words, they all are the same. And if I call the cap words, I, it ends up calling mine. Um, oh, something important to note here is I update wrapper, in addition to doing this work, will return essentially a reference to the function that I can then use later, which is what I'm doing here. Caching. So um, there's a couple of different features of caching in the Funk tools. 
The first one is LRU cache. Um, these are the, its default arguments. Um, it wraps a function with a, with a memoizing callable. Um, it saves time when an expensive function is sometimes called with the same arguments. It caches the results of the most recent max size call. So in this case, the default is 128. So that cache will hold up to 128 entries. Um, LRU, by the way, stands for least recently used. So as something more recent comes in, the oldest one gets kicked out. If typed is set to true, the function arguments for different types will be cached separately. So if you have a function that takes a number, integer three would be cached differently than the floating point 3.0. Otherwise, they're treated the same because they're uh, equivalent values. Um, the LUR cache, when you create it, has some attributes. Um, it has cache info, which will tell you the current state of the cache, like what's in it, how big it is. Um, it has a cache clear method, which allows you to clear out or invalidate the cache. And it also has a cache parameters method, which will return a, a new dict. So it's it, you, you can't use it to modify the value of the cache, but it'll basically tell you how it was instantiated. What's it? What was the max size and type used to create this LRU cache? Here's a quick example. Um, this is a fairly standard example. So I have a Fibonacci, and as those of you that have seen this before know that with bigger and bigger numbers, it gets more and more expensive because I'm I'm making all of these recursive calls. So what I do is I put an LRU cache on it. And what that means is that I can calculate out to fairly large numbers. Um, but Fibonacci to calculate, say, for the Fibonacci value for 10, I calculate the Fibonacci value for 8 and 9. Well, because of the way we've done this, we've calculated it for 0, for 1, for 2, so on and so forth. So by the time we get to these larger numbers, we've pre-calculated all the smaller ones. And they're now sitting in the cache. Um, so this runs fairly quickly. Uh, and what we can see is that we have 28 cache hits. 16 misses is basically means that the first time it sees each number, it doesn't know what the value is, so it has to calculate it. Um, uh, the max size, we got the default of 128. And it has 16 entries, which is the values for 0 through 15. And here we can see what the cache parameters, even though we didn't define them up here in the decorator, we just got the defaults. And we can see what those, those values are. Some caveats with LRU cache, um, the functions, positional, and keyword arguments must be hashable, which means that it can't take things like lists or um, mutable classes. The underlying storage for the LRU cache is a dictionary. That's, and so those function arguments are used as a key into that dictionary. So that's where this requirement is coming from. Um, it should only be used with peer functions. What that means is that the same inputs always produce the same output, which implicitly means that the function that you're caching should not have side effects. It shouldn't write to a database or, or do something that would mutate the system. Closely related to LRU cache is the recently introduced cache. And this is just a simple, lightweight, unbounded function cache. So it's the same as LRU cache with no maximum size. Um, because there's no eviction, because you never throw anything away from the cache, it's, it can be written in a way that makes it smaller and faster compared to LRU cache with a size limit, because you never need to compare about, have we hit the cache limit? What do I need to do? What's the oldest one? So all of that logic goes away. Um, the caveat with that is that if you're using it on something that takes a very large variety of inputs, you can end up with a, a very large cache. So use that one with, um, 
caution and forethought. Uh, related to these two is cash property, which is um, similar to property with the addition of caching. Uh, the value is computed once and then cached as a normal attribute for the life of the instance. Um, unlike property, cash property allows uh, writes without a setter method being defined. Uh, cash property only runs on lookup and only if the attribute doesn't already exist on the object. Once the attribute exists, subsequent reads and writes work like a normal attribute. So quick example here, um, we're taking in a sequence of numbers. We're storing it as a tuple of a sequence of numbers. So now we know that that sequence is immutable. Um, and then essentially we're gonna add a cache property standard deviation, and which will return the standard deviation of that sequence of numbers. So here I, I wanted to give you a sense of like what that cache property buys by us in terms of time. Um, so I'm taking a very large sequence, 10 million, and I'm calculating that standard deviation on that sequence. Um, the initial one, it's a little hard to read here, but you can see that it started at, call it 11 seconds and finished at 39 seconds. So it took somewhere on the order of 28 seconds to calculate this standard deviation. The very next time I call it, I still get the same answer, but now it took somewhere in the milliseconds to get that answer. So it's basically just a property lookup. So for things that are expensive to calculate, but don't change once they are calculated, this is a very handy thing to have. Uh, we're gonna just, briefly touched on order types using total ordering. Total ordering is a class decorator um, that makes it easy to create well-behaved, totally ordered types. Um, if a class defines at least one rich comparison operator, it will the, the decorator will supply the rest. So what that basically means is that you need to define one of these four, less than, less than or equal, greater than, or greater than equal, and the class decorator will generate all the rest of them. Uh, additionally, the class should supply an equal operator, though that is not strictly necessary. Um, one caveat with this is it does come at the co cost of slower execution and a more complex stack trace for the derived comparison operators, because essentially they get defined in using the one that you defined as uh, its implementation. So here's a quick example. Um, I created this car class. Um, it takes year, make, and model. Um, and I define equal and less than, and that's it. And these are just relatively simple comparisons uh, on year, make, and model. And so what this shows here is though, even though I only define the less than operator, I, I'm getting the greater than operator for free. And I'm getting it because of this class decorator, this total ordering. One more that we'll touch on is reduce. Um, reduce takes a function and an iteral, and it applies that function of two arguments cumulatively to the items of the iterable to reduce it to a single value. That's a lot of words, but if you've ever used the sum function, this is an example of a reducer. Um, well, Python has a built-in sum function. It doesn't have a built-in product function. So here we can use reduce to implement a product function. So we take reduce, we give it the operator mul or multiplier, and it takes an arbitrary iterable and it has an initial value of one. Um, and so now I can call product on a list a range or any other iterable, and it will just multiply them all together in the same way that sum adds them all together. 
And so this can be a handy thing to use um, for, for these kinds of situations. The last one, and this one in particular, could occupy a 25 minute talk all on its own. And this is single dispatch. This is where uh, we get into function overloading. Single dispatch is a function decorator which takes a function, transforms it into a single dispatch generic function. This means that the implementation is chosen based on the type of the single argument. So you have a different function for say integer versus a string versus a float versus a list versus whatever. The overloaded implementations are decorated with a register attribute so it so that when you call the function it knows where where the implement where to find the implementation. Um, if the implementation is annotated with types, the decorator will automatically infer the type of the argument. Otherwise, you have to declare what the type is in the decorator. So what does that look like? So here I have a function, fun, that takes an argument. This is my generic function. So this is, the def in some sense, the default implementation. So now I register um, a function. And notice here, I'm not even bothering to name it. it, it its name is immaterial. It, it's going to be an implementation detail for fun when it's called with an integer ar argument. Um, I'm going to also register it with a list argument. And then just to illustrate, th these are both using uh, type hints, where if I don't use a type hint, I have to declare the, the type up here in the function decorator. So now I, I've defined my generic function. I've defined it for an integer type, for a list type, and a complex type. So if I call it with an integer, I get the, the results of the integer implementation. If I call it with a list, I get the implementation of that. If I call it with a float, I get the default implementation, because I haven't provided uh, essentially a type specific version of the function. And if I call it with a complex number, I get the, the complex implementation. Single dispatch method is the same thing, but for class methods. It's a function decorator, which transforms a method into a single dispatch generic function. Um, the dispatch happens on the type of the first non-self or non-class argument. So that implies that you can use it both on uh, object methods and on class methods. So with that, we're going to wrap up. Um, so the FunkTools module contains many higher order functions, which are both useful and powerful. And using these functions can result in more readable and more maintainable code. Some references, um, of course, the Python language reference is an excellent place to start. Um, these slides are available on GitHub at the link that you see here. It's in uh, my GitHub repo, SJ Irwin. Uh, as I mentioned before, Martin Hines wrote a blog post um, pretty much on the same topic uh, called Funk Tools, the Power of Higher Order Functions in Python. Um, there's a, a, a somewhat more, um, I think th this one is from 2020. Florian uh, Dalitz wrote a blog, very similar introduction to Python's Funk Tools module. So uh, between these four pieces, this should get you uh, more interested and more uh, informed on Funk Tools. And with that, we're done. Okay, thank you, Scott. That was really, really a lot of information. I was learning a lot. <laughs> uh, I know, but there was a really important, you know, like I was seeing in the channel, like uh, a lot of people saying, "Yeah, today I learned something." Right? Like, uh, uh, I, I like uh, Funk tools. It's like uh, Eater tools, right? Those two yeah, the, 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 pages on the, they are really, really good. Um,
okay, so I have a few questions. Um, sure. The first one is, um, will using partial method for the examples, set alive and set dead, so that was, that was two examples that you were using, actually mm -hmm. be Pythonic? Will it be used in protection? Um, so I would argue that they would be Pythonic because they are lifted directly from the Python documentation themselves. <laughs> Um, That's a good answer. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's a way, if you didn't use that, you would end up having to essentially write a, a little two-line function that implements that. I mean, it would be relatively straightforward to write, but now you're being more verbose than you need to be. Yeah, fair point. Okay, so I have one more. I'm checking the channel if uh, someone is... And, and this was me, so I'm cheating. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'm a volunteer, so I have I can I can ask questions. Sure. Yeah, what's your favorite Funk Tools tool? <laughs> um, so probably based on slide count, you can guess that Partial is one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like most useful, I think I use at wraps more than anything. If you're writing decorators, you pretty much need to use at wraps. That's true. That's true. Um, and then, yeah, we are, I think we're okay. Um, could we define product with reduce to be in the scope in the tag? Let's talk. Could we define product um, with reduce? Um, I think I'm a little confused on the question. Yeah, me too. I'm, I, I was just copy pasting that, so maybe that person can. Uh, yeah, it, I'm, I'm happy I to do. answer the question, but I don't think I, I fully yeah. understand yeah, what. Let me, um, let me see. Yeah, maybe. Oh, maybe the question is if you can define product using reduce, I think. Oh, could yeah. you use map to achieve the same end result? Yes, yeah, you I could think, use map yeah. to achieve the same end result. Um, the, the main idea behind using reduce is it's just a little cleaner and easier to read what it's doing. Also, if you're coming from a uh, functional programming background or you've worked with functional programming languages, reduce is going to look very familiar. Yeah, that's true. OK, and I think I have one more. Wait. Oh, no, no, no that was just people interacting. So, so that was the last one. Uh, okay, I excellent. Tell you, uh, but if you want to keep uh, talking with Scott, uh, you have two options. You can go to Wonder Me, Scott, and see if someone reached you there, or you can just stay in the very cup room, uh, Brian. I'm, I'm, I'm sure people will, will be yeah, asking I'll you be... more questions. And sure. again, thank you very much for being, uh, for being a speaker in the conference. Well, thank you and for I hope having I see me. See you next year. Yeah. See you in Dublin. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. Cheers.